Uh, my name is Jay Mens. I'm the Executive Director of the Cambridge Middle East North Africa Forum. Uh, it's great to be joined by two uh, of our three star participants today uh, for a very timely and topical event. Timely and topical not only because of the pending World Cup game on Saturday, uh, but more importantly because France has emerged as one of the most important players in the Middle East, uh, certainly from Western perspective, behind the United States and Russia. Uh, that's in terms of Syria, that's in terms of Libya, uh, in terms of Gulf engagement, but also in terms of multilateral diplomacy. Uh, there is lots of interesting uh, conversations to be had vis-a-vis -vis, uh, President Macron's engagement with Iran and Iran's protests, or what he calls a revolution, uh, ongoing antagonism with Turkey, and of course how Ukraine has changed European and Mediterranean geopolitics, and how France is going to go forward managing uh, that uh, instability. Uh, but I will introduce two of our three panelists, as I mentioned, uh, hopefully Michelle will be joining us shortly, we're just working through some technical issues, but uh, that will not stop us from introducing uh, uh, Louis and Dorothy, who have very kindly joined. So we'll start with uh, Louis, because he is first on my screen. Uh, Louis is a career French diplomat and a member of the Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. He's currently a visiting fellow at the Washington Institute for Canaries Policy, as you can tell from his background. Uh, and Louis' stellar diplomatic career has taken him to the French Embassy in Morocco uh, to be a political advisor in Libya, in Qatar, in Oman. Uh, he's also worked at the Quai d'Orsay headquarters in Paris and as a research analyst for the French Ministry of Defense. And we're also kindly joined by Dorothée Schmitt for the second time now. Thank you, Dorothée. Um, she is a senior research fellow at the French Institute of International Relations, or IFRI, and director of the Middle East program. She has been with IFRI for for uh, I think 20 years now, and is also uh, the progenitor of the Institute's Contemporary Turkey program back in 2008. For that, Dorothy had a career in the private sector as a country risk analyst for Crédit Agricole and as a consultant to the European Commission, the Ministry of the Economy, and the French Foreign Ministry. Um, I'm just going to peruse our list of attendees just to see if, uh, if we have a last minute Hail Mary from Michelle. It appears not. Uh, so I think we should just launch straight into uh, our discussion. So I'll, I'll hand it to uh, to Dorothée, if you don't mind, for, for any opening points or, or comments or remarks about, first of all, you know, how you see the region as it is and you know what you think the broader French concerns are, and then uh, kindly ask you to do the same. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so I didn't necessarily expect to stop. Anyway, um, I've been a bit sort of struggling to to find some uh, introductory points because I think, um, of course, the MENA region is still very high in, on the agenda for France, but it's been uh, still relegated to a certain point since the Ukraine-Russia conflict started, and um, uh, the uh, domestic considerations as well, uh, the, the relative weakening of Emmanuel Macron's hand uh, within the French uh, political system has uh, made his very flamboyant diplomacy a little less uh, visible. Uh, so um, I think it's very important that we have we who, as a career diplomat, is able to comment from the from the, the, the within the bureaucracy, even if he's now posted in the same tank, uh, but to show how from within the state, uh, the French strategic posture in the region is seen. Um, I would say uh, in a very synthetic way that uh, I think the priorities of France vis-a-vis -vis the region are still very much informed by domestic considerations. So, uh, um, immigration is very much uh, a topic uh, that is on the mind of the president. And again, uh, um, I have to stress the importance of the specificities of the French institutional system, where the president is the one who's in charge of foreign policy and has very little counter powers in some way. I mean, the, the, the French parliament is just a, it's kind of a spectator to the French, the making and development and implementation of French foreign policy, except in times of extreme uh, crisis and the declaration of war or things like that. But uh, for day-to-day -day, uh, affairs, I'd say the, the president is in charge. And so this is probably why I see uh, domestic considerations do, interfering a, uh, do interfere a lot with the uh, construction of a foreign policy agenda. And this is what I say. Um, 
immigration is a very important point. Um, the terrorism as a name, as a second Islamic radicalism is an issue that is sometimes being seen as related. And now with the, the news coming from Syria and Iraq about the, uh, the re-rising of uh, ISIS uh, do provide uh, food for thought to analysts who are specializing on, on, on terror issues here. We see it very clearly at IFRI where we have a big security study center where they, one of the colleagues who's dealing specifically with uh, Islamic terrorism. Uh, but then there's another domestic consideration that is now bound to really weigh on the definition of French priorities, which is, of course, the um, energy uh, security. And uh, uh, clearly, this has become uh, the main preoccupation of public opinions in Europe. And um, our relationship, especially with Gulf countries, is bound to uh, take more um, importance uh, as long as we have, we know we have a strategic partnership that's quite well, uh, sort of full-fledged things with the UAE, uh, but we have to discuss with all potential energy providers from within the region. And if, when I mentioned uh, immigration as a first issue, clearly this plays into the relationship with the Maghreb. And so uh, if you take things geographically, I think it's very interesting to see that now there is a sort of rebalancing in, in the strategic thinking of the French towards Maghreb, towards North Africa, and the uh, um, uh, retreat from the Sahel does really give also more importance to our partnership, different partnerships with different uh, countries in uh, North Africa. So beyond the um, usual uh, uh, willingness of Macron to have a very strong protagonism on the international scene, to play as a sort of uh, um, the, uh, an opinion leader, a peacemaker, deal maker, deal breaker, etc. Um, uh, of course, uh, Libya is not only you know, a show of, of diplomatic skills for France, uh, it has to do both with energy, migrations, and security in the Sahel region. Algeria is the same um, story, and uh, we see now that in the first month of uh, 2023, there will be a sort of exercise to try and convince uh, the Moroccans that they do matter as much as the Algerians, but clearly there has been a sort of a, a preference being given to the bilateral relationship with Algeria on different levels. Um, and if we go further east, uh, we see Iran stuck and uh, Macron, of course, would like to have a say and to play a role in the rebuilding of some sort of security architecture in the Middle East. Uh, but this is extremely difficult to, to organize as the forces are not yet, I'd say, stabilized as uh, Iraq, which used to be um, a platform to organize French efforts in the region is definitely uh, uh, in a very difficult internal security situation again. So it happens to be um, not to be the easiest partner either. Lebanon, who is also, of course, uh, a preferred partner of the French, has basically imploded. Um, in Syria, we have not managed to uh, uh, restore any sort of uh, visible activity that leads anywhere. So um, remains Turkey, uh, that, which is a country that I'm uh, focusing a lot on, with whom we're in a state of um, sort of state of cold war. And if you talk to our ambassador in Ankara, he would say he thinks he has absolutely no leverage on the political side. So he's uh, convinced that he has to work on bilateral economic ties. Uh, cultural ties, but he thinks he, he is absolutely constrained by all the other options being taken in the region vis-a-vis uh, -vis our relationship with Turkey. And Turkey is clearly, um, uh, I wouldn't say a black hole, but it's a, it's a sort of an, of, an, of an exit of forces uh, from within the Middle East because it opens to the Black Sea and the special relationship with Russia, of course, uh, will make a difference in the future um, reorganizing of uh, uh, political balances in the region. So Turkey is the big piece that we have to address strategically and we still cannot fathom how to do it because it's a, a new actor with new methods 
And we still have the, would say, the, the culte du précédent in France, which is like we do rely a lot on past uh, glories, but also protocols, methods, etc. And we have difficulties, I would say, to reorganize our uh, uh, appareil, uh, uh, strategic uh, outlook and, uh, and methodologies. So um, there. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, the pretty uh, bleak and sweeping, sweeping uh, introduction. Welcome, Michel. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I will briefly introduce you, and then uh, perhaps we can spin to, to Louis for his introductory remarks. So, um, uh, Michel Duclos is a senior advisor at the Institut Montaigne and at the Atlantic Council's Rafik uh, Hariri Center and Middle East program. He's had uh, something of a legendary diplomatic career. He served as uh, French ambassador to Syria from 2006 2009, as diplomatic advisor to the interior minister from 2009 2012, as ambassador to Switzerland from 2012 to 2014. And before that, uh, Deputy Director of Policy Planning at the, Far at the Foreign Ministry, Council at the French Embassy in Moscow and Bonn, and one of the negotiators of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test uh, Ban Treaty. He's also the author of three books, uh, one of which is uh, for French readers, uh, La France dans le bouleversement du monde, which uh, would be a very apt title for this event, uh, and which I, which I strongly recommend. Um, but I'll, I'll zoom back to Louis, please, if you wouldn't mind, for, for your introductory thoughts and, and remarks, and then we'll, we'll circle back to Ambassador Duclos afterwards. Thank you very much, uh, Jay. Um, I think uh, it's essential to understand that uh, uh, France's policy in the Middle East and North Africa is fundamentally a neighborhood uh, policy. And... Um, that has been the case at least in the past uh, five years, and I think it will remain so uh, in the coming one. And this neighborhood dimension um, shapes the objectives and priorities of, of France, which are, in my view, first to develop people-to-people -people relations, second to project stability, and third to manage the ambitions of the local powers, which are sometimes very ambitious. And so to meet this objective, in my experience, um, France approaches the Middle East and North Africa through uh, what I would call three baskets. And the balance between these uh, three baskets changes between the circumstances. And I would agree with Dorothée that now uh, North Af Africa is very high in, in, in the East, uh, but um, regional security as, as well is. So the, the first basket is the North Africa basket. And by, by that, I'm talking about Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, which constitute uh, partners of their own in French diplomacy. Uh, because of history, French society and local societies are, are very much intertwined. And as a result, the cooperation between France and those countries uh, has a level of depth that is uh, without equivalent in the region. Um, these very deep relationships are centered on investments, uh, cultural exchanges, the issuance of visa more than and anything else. And if we want to sum up, um, the bilateral dimension of the relationship is much more significant than the cooperation on regional is issues, uh, more than with other countries in, in, in the region. Um, the, the second basket is, is what France calls its st strategic partners in the region. And here I'm talking about countries with which uh, France has a relation based on defense acquisitions and defense partnerships in the first place, but with which France is trying also to develop society to society ties. Um, like uh, with the countries in the first basket, but is not there yet. And so there I'm talking typically about Egypt, um, the UAE, Saudi Arabia. Um, and looking at France, those countries um, uh, are expecting partial security guarantees. And by that, uh, I mean not the same level of security guarantees than the one offered by the US, but some kind of security guarantees. And they can include uh, counterterrorism in Egypt, for instance, uh, fighting against Iranian influence or proxies uh, with uh, the UAE or Saudi Arabia. And it is with those strategic partners that France intera interacts pre preferably when looking at re regional issues. And one good example of that is the coordination with Saudi Arabia in the Lib Lebanese crisis. 
Um, the third uh, basket is instability man management. And I think it's the most publicized The role of France within the E3 to negotiate back then and now revive the GCPOA. Uh, it's the role uh, played by France at the UN Security Council. Uh, it's the mediation in Lebanon with the US and Saudi Arabia. It's also uh, the efforts to develop a regional security architecture through the Baghdad Conference, uh, which was held in uh, August 2021. So those are the three baskets and the balance between them changes. One thing which I think is transversal to all those baskets is Europe. And I would say that France has a tendency to, to bring more Europe in, in the region. And I think it's the case for three reasons. Uh, first, uh, because France wants uh, more uh, autonomous EU, able to deal with, with problems in its own neighborhood. Uh, second, because it's better to have uh, the EU or at least some European countries than uh, Russians or Chinese. And third, uh, because to some extent, France perceives the EU's influence um, as an extension of its own power. And so resulting from that, you will see the hands or the influence of France in many uh, EU strategies and policies. So uh, like in the Gulf strategy that was uh, adopted back in spring, in the use of some uh, EU funds, um, you have the MSO military operation in, in the Gulf, um, Whenever the EU adopts uh, sanctions, France is one of the uh, one of the leading countries to work on those regimes. Um, thank you. I'm I'm, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Louis. And last but certainly not least, uh, it would be good to hear some uh, introductory thoughts from uh, from uh, Michel, who has the added benefit of having spent time in Moscow and dealt with the with the Russian question. Uh, while uh, while our generation was uh, was forgetting about it. Sorry, I just need to un unmute. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry to be a, a bit late. Um, I, I, I will not contradict what uh, Dorothy and we uh, have said, and uh, I, I will try maybe to be uh, complementary in my remarks. Maybe starting with uh, your last point, uh, Russia. Um, the, the, over the, the, during the last years, the, the, the landscape in the Middle East was to, to a large extent characterized by uh, a tendency uh, uh, to some uh, American withdrawal. Of course, you have to qualify that, but uh, uh, the Americans wanted to be less uh, active and less present. And at the same time, the Chinese and the Russians were coming. Um, and, and to a large extent, the, the Russians had uh, considerably increased their influence due to their intervention in, uh, in Syria, which uh, gave a, a, a kind of prestige to them and from that, uh, they were able to uh, build uh, a considerable uh, influence in the region. Um, for all the reasons, they have been good, I think, in uh, connecting themselves with Iran. So they were also a, a strong pillar in the Iranian uh, uh, crisis. That, that was uh, yesterday, let's say. Uh, today, after the invasion of uh, Ukraine, the, the first thing which is uh, striking is that uh, the Russian positions in the region uh, are holding. That is to say, you don't uh, see, for the time being, a big decrease of uh, Russian influence. Uh, they have, uh, of course, uh, their game with Turkey is up, very complicated, but for the time being, it's working. 
uh, they are keeping their good relations with the Gulf countries. And to some extent, uh, what I call the uh, inhibited uh, middle powers are the big uh, beneficiaries of the uh, war. And among them, uh, for instance, Saudi Arabia, of course. And Iran, to, to, to some extent, because uh, Russia is becoming, to uh, to some extent, uh, uh, dependent upon uh, upon Iran uh, for various uh, reasons. That the current situation, nobody can say how long it is going to to last, because for two reasons. First, uh, probably the Russians have to divert some of their resources from Syria, for instance, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. So uh, at some point, they will become less uh, influential in, in Syria and maybe elsewhere. And, uh, and, and so the second reason is that if they are losing, uh, of course, the way uh, countries and the region look at them will change. And for instance, their credibility as uh, arms purveyors and, and security uh, providers will probably uh, suffer. Where is France uh, in this uh, landscape? The thing is that we have certainly uh, lost a number of our traditional uh, leverages in the region. Um, for instance, the uh, PPO, the, 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 the Palestinian issue, something we have neglected uh, for a long time. And, and it's less important than it used to be. Now it's uh, replaced by the uh, uh, Abraham uh, Accord. And France is not against, but it's not central in this uh, new process. Uh, Lebanon, uh, as uh, Dr. said, uh, uh, we may be uh, the, the most influential uh, external uh, uh, Western power in Lebanon, but, but it remains that we don't play a big part. And Lebanon is uh, uh, living a uh, life uh, on itself. Um, Something which is uh, not neglectable is that the U I said the US is supposed to withdraw, but in fact, the US is reorganizing its presence in the region, recording uh, new lines, the Abraham Accord, their military presence, and things like that. And in that process, also, France and by the way, UK uh, do not play a, a big part. And maybe last but not least, the Security Council. One of the um, added value or one of the advantages of uh, France and UK, by the way, in the region used to be our status as permanent members of the UNSC. But in the current situation uh, of total paralysis of the United Nations and especially the Security Council and that for years, um, since years now, it's less important. We can't rely anymore on, uh, on that, uh, uh, that card. Uh, on the other hand, I must say, uh, we, we are keeping, of course, strong partnerships with a variety of, uh, of players in the region. Um, probably there are also newcomers in our game, for instance, Algeria, which is one of the few countries who are uh, going from the Ukrainian crisis, the lesson that after all, maybe Russia is not as reliable as they thought. But for me, the, the big uh, issue, the big question is what is going to happen for the next crisis? And I don't see how 
we could avoid something big around Iran, uh, given the uh, nuclear um, impasse, uh, the internal uh, trouble of the country, and many other parameters. And uh, it would be, uh, to be very difficult for me to tell you what, what part fans can play in the management of, uh, of the next crisis. That would end my, my remarks, uh, Jay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, all of you, for the, for the introductory remarks. It gives us quite a lot of, uh, of topics to, to try and cover in the time that we have left. Um, I think one of the interesting things to perhaps begin with, of course, Lebanon, we must discuss, Iran, we must discuss. Uh, but Dorothy really caught my attention when you use the phrase Cold War with Turkey. I think it's very interesting um, because, you know, France had this antagonism with, uh, with Turkey before uh, the Ukraine crisis. Now that it's erupted, now that Turkey's playing such a prominent role in managing that crisis or taking advantage of that crisis, others might say, um, you know, in terms of how that's going to play out in the lead up to Turkey's elections in June, uh, do you do you see a, another Mediterranean crisis, more frigates being uh, being flagged with lasers and, and such events? Do you see more of that, or it would be interesting, of course, to hear from others too? Um, so there are there are several layers um, of difficulties with Turkey, and it's only building up with time. Uh, and it's mainly increasing because Turkey is asserting itself as a, an important regional player. And so um, the, the background is one of a sort of strategic competition between France and Turkey for influence in the region. Uh, and if, as, uh, as I say, we consider that France has uh, uh, lost some uh, um, leverage, some um, specific... Um, points of forces in the region and that its uh, methods are a little obsolete. Turkey is exactly the contrary. It's gaining partners uh, and it's acting very opportunistically and very swiftly, uh, including uh, planning and implementing military operations when it's needed, as they think, in the region. So um, this strategic competition is between, in some way, asymmetric competitors. We don't have the same points of force. We're not, we're not playing exactly the same game. And then uh, there is the other problem of EU-Turkey relations. And this plays more globally into the general framework of um, the, the, the main sphere of uh, belonging for Turkey. Is it Western? Is it moving to the East, etc.? So Europe, in the, in the way Turkey sees it, uh, is associated to the West, to NATO, to its relationship with the US, but it's secondary. And it's secondary also because the EU-Turkey accession process has come to a complete, uh, has been really super slowed down and not, it's not a complete impasse, but uh, it's, not, it's not absolutely finished because nobody wants to end it. But we see that it's blocked uh, clearly and the Turks would systematically blame it on the French. And what is very striking to me is that if you go to Turkey now, they would, uh, the, 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 the historical character that was always pop up in the conversation with the French is Nicolas Sarkozy. Nicolas Sarkozy is responsible for every difficulty of Turkey uh, nowadays with the EU. Um, and then comes a list of like, uh, you didn't understand anything about Cyprus, like you let Cyprus join the EU without solving the division uh, of the island. And then, but then the latest development is of course the partnership with Athens. And, uh, and this is playing with very specifically into the uh, France, Turkey, France, EU relation, because uh, France is seen as aligning with Greece on a national basis, let's say. Well, there's this kind of uh, Hellenophilia and the um, philhellenism in English, merci. And uh, um, a sort of a personal uh, preference of Macron that's being uh, very clearly put forward with uh, Mitsotakis, etc. And the Turks 
see this uh, touching upon the, the, the way that they define the very narrowly the, the national interests. It plays into this Aegean dispute and the French want to make this Aegean dispute a uh, protection of EU border kind of issue. And the Turks say it is a bilateral uh, thing with Greece and we have to solve it bilaterally with Greece and we don't want the EU to interfere in this. So uh, the, the, the way relations have developed with Athens is really being seen as something specifically aggressive that France has towards Turkey. It doesn't mean that uh, it will it will sort of push the Turks to to become more uh, uh, to make more difficulties in the Aegean. This this has to do specifically with how the the, the uh, foreign policy of Turkey is uh, is being instrumentalized in uh, the Erdogan's internal campaign, and of course uh, the Mediterranean and the Aegean are a very good, um, they're a real, um, uh, they're, they're a positive parameter of Erdogan because it's consensual in Turkey. I mean, there is a big national attachment to, to, to the Aegean. There is a, a global, uh, globally shared opinion that uh, uh, the Greek islands that are close to Turkey are too close and we have to solve it and we cannot, we cannot uh, admit the rearmament of this and, and the, uh, the Greeks are going too far, etc. And I think we can really say that this is shared by the opposition and the, the, the current uh, incumbent of power in, in Turkey. So AK Parti and the opposition do agree on this. They also do agree on Syrian refugees. Uh, the only difference is the way they want to solve uh, the way they want to get rid of the refugees, basically. I mean, uh, and one in some way proposing solutions, strange solutions of, uh, uh, you know, building, securing a, a safe zone in Syria, building shelters, etc. probably with the help of uh, European money. This is his dreams. Um, so uh, the, the Turkey, the, the, the France-Turkey relations previously had specifically bilateral issues like the Armenian issue, uh, political Islam, and still Macron is very much blamed for the law on separat Islamic separatism in France. Uh, but now I think it's playing bigger. It has become more strategic and France is a, is a natural opponent for Turkey as it's, it has assumed leadership within the EU for some time, for a long time, since probably the creation of the European Union, in fact. Uh, on diplomatic issues. So, uh, and the problem is that uh, we are working on strategic autonomy and Macron is doing that um, parallel to this difficulty with Turkey. He doesn't really want to, he doesn't want to address Turkey as a strategic issue. He doesn't want to take it, to, to give it, I would say, um, in some way, the, the space that he has gained. And um, so the Communauté Politique Européenne was also a trick in some way to dilute Turkey in a bigger, wider community, and the Turks accepted it very well, because let me tell you what the Turkish ambassador told us in the closed session two weeks ago, the EU is dead, only NATO matters, and maybe the Community Politico European in the end will replace the EU, so it's good to be in. Uh, so it's like sort of downplaying, down downgrading systematically the EU, France's role, etc., showing that you're in a position of force uh, all the time. and. Uh, what I see in the French context is a systematic, I would say, underestimation of the role of the regional role of Turkey. Interesting. I'm kind of pivoting to, uh, I don't know if uh, Louis or Michel, you have, you have any thoughts about Turkey, but pivoting to the other you know, major issue in, in, in the region, um, there's obviously the question of, of Iran, and it's been very interesting from the outside to think about the evolution of President Macron's remarks and, and, and thinking about the Iranian question, of course, from the beginning of the protest, um, well, before the protest, actually, you have the French commitment to the resurrection of the JCPOA, of the nuclear deal. Then you have the beginning of the protests and some vague support. And then, of course, you have the, the visit of the four Iranian dissidents to the Elysee Palace and his pointed use of the term uh, revolution, women's revolution, um, and it's it's very interesting to think about this both in the context of you know French political history, uh, you know the revolution, enlightenment values, and so on, 
but also in terms of France's alignment with with the Gulf, um, you know, even more so than, than the United States, one could say. Um, so it would be, be interesting as we as we think about Turkey as one major set of questions to perhaps think about, you know, Iran and how this triangulates into into the region's geopolitics too. I don't know if either Leah Michelle, you have uh, you have any strong strong thoughts or feelings about that? Uh, on Turkey, I would say that uh, the issue of the um, European uh, political community was uh, a test because at the beginning, uh, Dorothe, if you remember, uh, the Elysee Palace was reluctant to invite uh, Erdogan. I, I guess, and I can't, can't be sure of that, but I guess that the, uh, the, the civil servants, the, the, the diplomats, insisted that you could not do that without Turkey, of course. And uh, ultimately, uh, uh, Macron uh, didn't object to the invitation of uh, President Erdogan. Uh, there has been a truce in their personal relationship since now uh, more than year, one year. So they stopped uh, big uh, public fighting and things like that. So in a way, the relations are not good, of course. Uh, they, uh, there are a lot of uh, the, the problems uh, remained uh, more or less uh, the same as before. But there are uh, a few uh, new options, uh, including uh, this uh, political European, uh, European political uh, community. Uh, I'm not sure that this means that we have a strategy, but by the way, any other Western power or any other uh, international player uh, will wait for the next uh, 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 elections in Turkey before reassessing uh, the options. Uh, on Iran, uh, <laughs> uh, I was in the Elysee Palace my, myself when uh, President Macron uh, received the, the four um, uh, Iranian uh, ladies. Well, you know, it's clear that in terms of image, uh, domestic policies, and, and so on, it's almost irresistible uh, for uh, a Western leader not to cheer up uh, when you see uh, uh, those, those ladies, of course. Um, but from a strategic point of view, what's really uh, striking and, and very worrisome for me is a conjunction of uh, uh, Iran going nuclear, uh, seizing the opportunity of the Ukrainian war uh, to get some kind of, uh, if not approval, at least uh, green lights from Russia in exchange of probably uh, armament transfers. And the uh, the uh, supreme leader making a choice of going east when the population traditionally in uh, Iran would have preferred either, well, let's say, neither east nor, nor west, which was the usual, the initial uh, motto of the Islamic revolution. Now they are choosing uh, the east at the very moment when the population in Iran is clearly showing that they want something else. Uh, they want a degree of freedom and equality uh, for women, which in practice means Western values. So we are in a really very, very strange situation. And I, I can't uh, believe that uh, something uh, will not happen. I mean, it's, it's very unlikely that there will be a revolution, a regime change, and things like that, but probably some change inside the, uh, the, the, the power in Iran. And, and a difference 
a different uh, balance of power in the decision making process in Tehran. And it's, I think it's very important that we are probably one of the few, France is one of the few countries who still keep uh, a strong uh, eye on Iran, uh, but we are going to face very difficult situation in my view. Very interesting. It will be interesting to get your thoughts, especially sitting in Washington. I'm sure you're privy to some very, very interesting discussions, uh, especially with our friends at the Washington Institute. Um, be good to to get your sense about uh, about how that's going to evolve, and then after that we can move to Q and A as the questions are starting to roll in. Um, on 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 Turkey first, I think it's um, important to remember that there was a, a significant improvement uh, compared to where we were before uh, in the relation between France and Ankara in March 2022. Um, it was very swift and very superficial in a way but we went from zero or below zero to high level meetings delegations going to turkey turkish delegation coming to france nato patrol joint french turkish nato patrol in the eastern mediterranean um, and of course i agree with dorothe it did not materialize and develop into something deeper but it's um, still better much better com compared to where we were uh, when I was working on Libya uh, for, for an instant. Um, on the GCPOA, um, seen from Washington, I think it's, it's very interesting to look at the joint statement between Macron and Biden uh, after the state visit. The paragraph on Iran does not mention the GCPOA, does not mention any diplomatic option uh, to uh, counter the non-compliance of the Iranians on the nuclear program. And it has been read by many uh, in town as the sign that the GCPOA, in the form that was proposed in March, is now off the table because of the supply of drones, because of the crackdown on our protesters. Um, I don't think this is something that is going to be formalized by Western diplomats. Uh, for the simple reasons that they don't have uh, a better option for now. And we've seen in 2018, when Trump uh, withdrew from the GCPOA, that when you drop something like the GCPOA without a viable alternative, it's not good and the, and the consequences are, are bad. So I, I think we're at this juncture be between the proposal that was put forward in March 2021, and uh, a future process that, that still needs to be defined. Excellent. Well, thank you. We have a, a few questions um, just to, to all of our attendees. Um, they are uh, they're, they're trickling the Q&A function. Uh, I'm not sure how to see it as a as a panelist, but uh, please use the Q&A function. I've got four questions already. Um, we'll start with one from Elizabeth Turner. Um, do you think there will be an increased need for scholarship on France or on issues for the coming years? And with that, um, knowledge of the Farsi language, uh, I guess that could be rephrased. Does, does, does France have the language abilities to actually do, uh, do the research needed? Don't know if anyone is uh, so willing to take that, or we can move to the next one. Um, if I can just say a word, uh, I see I'm, I'm witnessing the, the fashions um, among students uh, when I recruit interns to work with my program. And um, in the wake of the signing of the GCPOA, there was a very strong tendency from uh, students to start a PhDs on Iran directly. Um, because the, the political context was there, it was, it was inducive. And so at the same time, they usually, of course, um, took on a scholarship on uh, learning Farsi at the, at the INELCO. Um, so uh, the iner inertia playing, we can expect a generation of young students to be more familiarized with Farsi and to, to have um, yeah, a better sort of background knowledge on, on Iran. 
um, in like four or five years, maybe we'll have a whole generation of people who will be able to handle things in a more a field, uh, uh, field work type of approach. But the problem is that they cannot travel to Iran currently. So um, I think in the, in the way these academic research are conceived, uh, at least in French universities, uh, doing field work is uh, strictly connected to your ability to uh, to to dissert on the, on the issues, so uh, I, I I don't I don't see if there is no improvement in bilateral relations and multilateral states of Iran as a as an internal player that uh, this could thrive. But there was there was a there was a positive starting point a few years ago. If this is of any use. Excellent. So we'll move to Ali Ali anonymous uh, attendee um, this is tailored towards Michelle. Do you think the JCPA will be revived? And I'm sure everyone has, uh, has feelings about this and some answers. And what are your views about, uh, so there, there are lots of questions in one. So we'll start with the JCPOA and, and the future of it. I'm afraid the, the situation, the JCPOA is dead. And the, in the same time, uh, both parties uh, do have a, an interest not to declare it uh, dead. So we will stay in a kind of a limbo situation uh, for, for some months, I believe. Uh, but I, I, I can't see how you can uh, revive the, the agreement uh, now, frankly speaking. Do you have any uh, any any thoughts? <laughs> um, no, I completely uh, agree with what M Michel said. I think the regime uh, would not want to revive the deal now because it would uh, make him appear weak on the domestic scene. And for obvious reasons, the E3 and the US uh, could not sustain re reviving the deal now. Uh, and as I said earlier, I think the deal in its in the shape that was uh, its shape in back in March 2021. Uh, I think uh, if there is a deal in the future, it will be in a long time, and the form of the deal is, will be very different. Uh, yes, from... and 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 probably on other basis than the current one. Yes. We have a few more questions that have. Can I just ask a question on the GCPOA to the diplomats? Like the the fact that the this agreement has been negotiated in, in a multilateral uh, frame with uh, Russia and China being two important players in, uh, in reaching a consensus in the end. How does the uh, Ukraine Russia uh, conflict play into this? How do you see uh, Russia? Um, uh, Russia's protagonism in the in the, in the former GCPO and any, any reviving of the agreement uh, will it impede anything? Frankly speaking, the Dorothe, I'm very pessimistic because um, all this process has been based on the assumption that Russia, especially Russia, had the same interest than us in terms of status and in terms of avoiding uh, effects from Iran, but already more importantly, in terms of status, uh, uh, a stake in, uh, in non-proliferation. But that, that implied a, a rational player in, uh, in Russia and uh, it, it's likely that they are not there anymore now. Their immediate priority is to win, not, not exactly the war because that will be very difficult for them, but to win the global confrontation with the West. And from that point of view, they need all possible allies and they don't have uh, so much allies, they have uh, uh, Iran and, by the way, North Korea. And uh, I have no doubt that they are prepared to pay any price uh, 
to get uh, support and, and armaments from those two rogue sets uh, from our point of view. So the situation is very bad. And China, uh, it's more difficult, but I don't have the, the impression that they are yet there in terms of uh, being a mature nuclear uh, player. Their immediate priority is to continue to grow their own arsenals. I'm not sure that as worry about uh, non-proliferation or proliferation than we are, frankly speaking. So I see a situation in which both Russia and uh, China, it's not that they are going to support Iran, it's that they could close their eyes simply to what Iranians uh, are doing. Uh, if the Iranians are doing that uh, in an astute way, uh, it's not too visible, not too outrageous, and uh, I'm afraid you can trust the Iranians to do that. On uh, on China, honestly, I, I I don't know the answer. But on Russia, maybe one of uh, one element of response is the big question uh, that uh, everybody is trying to answer, uh, at least in Washington at the moment, which is what is the compensation offered by Russia to Iran in exchange for its su support? And one of the hypotheses uh, um, to answer this question is whether Iran is going to ask Russia to be uh, less aligned with, with the Western powers in the negotiation on the GCPOA. So it could take the form of, uh, uh, of votes in the IAEA, for instance. I mean, there are many options on the table, but one of the compensation, one of the possible com compensations by Russia to Iran could be to be less strict on the nuclear proliferation aspect. Interesting. Pivoting to the Levant, um, this is a very blunt question from an anonymous attendee. Is Lebanon dead? Is it France's fault? Um, I think the, the, the pejorative tone is, is maybe not, uh, can, can be considered in the abstract. Is it France's fault in that? Was, was there really an opportunity to have even missed I guess is the question, and, uh, and I know Louis, you've spent a lot of time in in in, in Beirut. It would be interesting to get your 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 thoughts on on both of those questions. Um, I think Lebanon, or at least the Lebanese political class, uh, has been on that path for a very long time, and it surprised many that Lebanon didn't crash into the wall sooner. Um, no, I, I, uh, I think that one of the hopes for the Lebanese is this good coordination between the US, uh, France, and Saudi Arabia. I think, personally, I think it's the driving force behind every tiny step made by, this, by the Lebanese uh, political class. Uh, but... Uh, I'm I'm not very hopeful if, if it's the if it's the real question behind the provocative one. If I, if I could just add the two 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 words on this. Uh, Lebanon is not dead as a country, but it has lost value as a geopolitical asset, basically. So I think that's the main problem. And I don't see how or why this could be France's fault. I think uh, it's it's been a, it's a national sport to find scapegoats in Lebanon. It's very, uh, very fair, fair response. Um, this is interesting. This is for Michelle. Um, what are your views about the future of Syria given the current stalemate? Is it possible for Bashar al-Assad to be rehabilitated after human rights abuses you know, return for some stability in the country. Well, uh, I am uh, hesitating between two 
positions or to views. The first one would, would be to say that uh, Bashar will be there forever, that there is no reasons to see a change of the equation. There is no game changer, unfortunately, in this uh, uh, country. So Syria will remain uh, divided with uh, Assad controlling no more than two thirds of the country. Probably is there much more as an agent of the Iranians and the Russians than uh, as a real leader, but in the same time, um, for the time being, there is a, an, an alignment between Russia, Israel, and, and Iran, uh, and, and more and more so uh, Turkey, then uh, he should stay. So that, that's the first view. Another view would be to say that the fate of Assad will be uh, decided in Kherson or Mariupol, or maybe uh, Crimea. That is to say that uh, if Putin at some point has to, um, to leave the, the, the power to, to someone else in Moscow, uh, any other Russian leader will be less interested in uh, keeping this investment in, in Syria. But all that is a big uh, if, of course. And, uh, and unfortunately, for the time being, I don't see major changes in, uh, in Syria. Okay. On, that, uh, on that pessimistic note, I think we should, uh, we should wrap. Thank you very much to, to all of our panelists for a, for a very interesting conversation. Um, and we hope to see our attendees at our next event on Monday, on December 12th, with uh, Brian Hook, the designer of uh, most of current US sanctions on Iran, and uh, in, according to the Iranian media, the killer of Soleimani. Um, thank you very much, Dorothée, Louis, and Michel, uh, for your time. Pleasure. And we look forward to staying in touch. Merci.